الحمد للہ وصلاۃ وسلام علی رسول اللہ علیہ علیہ وصاحب اجمعین اما آباد اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم اولم یر الزین قفر ان السماوات والارض کان تر تکنما مجلنا من المائک اللہ شعین ہے افلا یمنون رب شلی صدری ویسلی امری وحل العدت من لسانی افق و قولی respected honorable raja of police the tanku the vice chancellor as well as the staff and the students i welcome all of you with the islamic greeting the assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh may peace mercy and blessings of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be on all of you it's an honor and a great pleasure for me to be back in malaysia and especially in the state of perlis it was my desire to be in the state mashallah and finally allah has made it possible and i would like to thank the royal family as well as the university of perlis for giving me this honor to give a presentation in this university the topic of this morning's talk of mine is the quran and modern science conflict or conciliation the glorious quran is the last and final revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which was revealed to the last and final messenger prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. For any book to claim that it is the word of God, for any revelation to claim that it is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it should stand the test of time. In the olden days, it was the age of miracles. And alhamdulillah, the glorious Quran is the miracle of miracles then came the age of literature and poetry muslim and non-muslim arabic scholars alike they acclaim the glorious quran to be the best arabic literature on the face of the earth but today if a religious scripture in a very poetic fashion says that the earth is flat will a modern man believe in it and the answer is no because today is not the age of literature and poetry today is the age of science and technology so let us analyze today whether the glorious quran it conflicts or conciliates with science according to a very famous physicist and a nobel prize winner by the name of albert einstein he said that science without religion is lame and religion without science is blind let me remind you that the glorious quran is not a book of science s c i e n c e but it's a book of signs s i g n s it's a book of ayats and there are more than 6000 ayats more than 6000 signs in the glorious quran out of which more than 1000 speak about science As far as my talk today is concerned I will not be speaking about scientific theories and scientific hypotheses because all of us know very well that many a times the scientific theories and hypotheses they take you turns Today I will only be speaking about scientific facts which have been established It was about 50 years back in the field of astronomy there were a group of scientists who described how did our universe come into existence and this they called as the big bang and they said that our universe initially was one primary nebula then there was a secondary separation a big bang which gave rise to galaxies the stars the planets and the earth on which we live this they called as the big bang and i started my talk by quoting a verse from the glorious quran from sorry ambia chapter number 21 verse number 30 which says awalam yaral ladina kafaru do not the unbelievers see anna samawati wal ardh kana taraktahuma kana taraktahuma that do not the unbelievers see that the heavens and the earth were joined together and we clove them asunder this what the scientists discovered about 50 years back 
is mentioned in the Quran 1400 years ago. That Big Bang watch the scientists have discovered recently. Previously, we did not know what was the shape of the earth. And many thought that the earth was flat and they were afraid to venture too far lest they would fall over. It was in 1577 when Sir Francis Drake, when he sailed around the earth, he proved that the earth was spherical. Quran says in Surah Luqman, chapter number 31, verse number 29, Alam tara anna Allah yuliju layla fin nahari, that it is Allah who has created the night and the day. And the night slowly merges into the day. And the day merges into the night. This merging is a gradual and slow process. If the earth was flat, there would have been a sudden change. This proves that the earth is spherical. Allah repeats the message in Surah Az-Zumur, chapter 39, verse number 5, that it is He, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who overlaps the night and the day, and overlaps the day unto the night. The Arabic word is kawara, means overlapping, or how you tie a turban around the head. This overlapping of night into the day and day into the night is only possible if the earth was spherical. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Naziat, chapter number 79, verse number 30. Allah says, Wal ard baad azalika dahaha, that we have made the earth as an expanse. The Arabic word dahaha, one of its meaning is derived from the Arabic word duya which means egg shape. And we know today that the egg is not completely round like a ball. It is geospherical. Today the world we know is not completely round like a ball. It is flattened from the pole. It is geospherical in shape. And this daha doesn't refer to a normal egg. It specifically refers to the egg of an ostrich. And daha also means where the ostrich lays the egg. So imagine the Quran mentioned 1400 years ago that the shape of the earth is geospherical, which we came to know recently. Previously, we did not know that the light of the moon was reflected light. We thought it was its own light. And the Quran calls the sun as Siraj, and its light, the sun is called as Shams, and its light is always called a siraj, diya or wahaj, meaning a torch, blazing glory, or a shining light. And the moon is referred to as kamar, and it's described, its light is described as munir or nur, meaning borrowed light or reflection of light. Always the Quran refers to the moonlight as munir or nur, meaning a reflection of light or borrowed light. Never does it refer to as its own light. And today science has confirmed that the light of the moon is not its own light, it's a reflected light of the sun. When I was in school, I passed my school in 1982, I had learned that the sun and the moon, though it revolved, the sun did not rotate about its own axis. But the Quran mentions in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 33, nahara. It's Allah who has created the night and the day and continues, the sun and the moon, each one traveling in an orbit with its own motion. So the Quran says that the sun and the moon, besides revolving, it also rotates about its own axis. The Arabic word yasbuhun is derived from the Arabic word sabaha, which describes the motion of a moving body. If I use this Arabic word for a person on the floor, it will not mean he's rolling, it will mean he's walking or running. If I use it for a person in water, it will not be floating, it will mean it's swimming. So when it's mentioned in the Quran referring to a, to a celestial body, it doesn't mean just flying, it means rotating about its own axis. And imagine the Quran 1400 years ago said something what I learned in the school in 1982, that's about 35 years back, it is different. Today, after science has advanced, we have come to know that the sun rotates about its axis. And if you have the image of the sun on a tabletop, we find it has got black spots. And these black spots take about 25 days to complete one rotation, indicating that the sun takes about 25 days to complete one rotation. Imagine what I read in school. The Quran disagrees. And today, science says 
that what the Quran has mentioned 14 years ago is correct. Furthermore, the Quran says in Surah Anbiya, chapter number 21, verse number 32, that we have made the sky as a protected ceiling. Today, science tells us that the atmosphere outside the earth, it acts like a protected ceiling. It prevents the harmful radiation of the ultraviolet rays and the X-rays to reach the earth. If it doesn't act like a filter, life will not be able to live on the face of the earth. Quran mentioned this 14 years ago that we have made the sky as a protected ceiling. Furthermore, today, science tells us that the sunlight we have is due to a phenomena which is taking place through billions of years. And one day, this chemical reaction in the sun, it will cease to exist. And the sun will cease to exist. Quran says in Surah Yasin, chapter 36, verse 38, that the sun is running its course. That the sun is running its course to a place determined. The Arabic word mustaqar means a place determined or for a period determined. And today science tells us that the sun, along with the solar system, is moving to a point in the universe known as Alpha Rayla, at a speed of 12 miles per second. So science today says that one day the sun will extinguish, and Quran says the sun is running for a period determined, to a place determined. Furthermore, according to a very, a very famous scientist by the name of Edwin Hubble, he said that our universe is expanding. And Quran says in Surah Dariya, chapter 51, verse number 47, that we have created the vastness of space that is the expanding universe. The Arabic word is Mu'asiyuna. Imagine, the Quran mentions all these things 14 years ago. Just because the Quran mentions all these things 14 years ago, which science has discovered yesterday, maybe 50 years back, 100 years back, 200 years back, 300 years back, will you say that the Quran conciliates or conflicts with modern science. There may be certain skeptics who will say, it's nothing great that the Quran speaks for astronomy since the Arabs were advanced in the field of astronomy. I do agree with them that the Arabs were advanced in the field of astronomy, but I'd like to remind them that the glorious Quran was revealed centuries before the Arabs became advanced in the field of astronomy. So it is from the Quran that the Arabs learned about astronomy and not the vice versa. In the field of physics, there's a theory known as atomism, which was propounded by the Greek, by the Democrats, about 23 centuries before. And this theory states that the atom is the smallest part of matter, which cannot be divided. And this was known even to the Arabs. And in Arabic, the word is zarra. And the Arabic word zarra is also mentioned in the Quran. So people will think if the Quran talks about zarra, about atom, it cannot be divided. So the Quran is outdated. But when you read the Quran, it's mentioned in Surah Sabah, chapter number 34, verse number 3, as well as Surah Yunus, chapter number 10, verse number 61, that when the unbelievers say, the hour will never come. Tell them, it will surely come with the permission of thy Lord. In whose record is propitious, clear, things smaller and greater than the atom. So the Quran says that there are things smaller and greater than the zarra. So the Quran is not outdated, the Quran is up to date. In the field of hydrology, we all learned in school about the water cycle. How does the water evaporate from the ocean? It forms into clouds, moves into the interior, it falls down as rain, and the water cycle is completed. This was first propounded by Sir Bernard Palissy in 1580. But before that, people did not know about this water cycle. In 7th century BC, it was phase of Miletus, he said, 
that it was the spray of the ocean which was picked up by the wind which fell into the interior as rain. <coughs> At the time of Ptolemy, people did not know how did the underground water come from. And they thought that it was the pressure of the wind which thrust the water into the interior. And they thought that then it fell down as rain and the water went back to the ocean to a secret passage known as Plato's time as Tartarus. Even in 17th century, Descartes believed in it. And in 19th century, Aristotle thought that the mountain caverns, the water evaporated and condensed in mountain, uh, mountain caverns. They did not know from where did the underground water come. Today we know that the underground water is from the seepage of the rainwater in cracks in ground. And Quran says in Surah Zumur chapter 39 verse 21, that seest thou not, it is Allah, it's almighty God, who sends downward from the skies and leads it into cracks and causes sown field of varying colors to grow. The Quran says in Surah Rum, chapter number 30, verse number 24, that it is we who bring the water from the sky and give life to the earth after it is dead. Quran says in Surah Mu'minun chapter 23 verse number 18 that we bring water from the sky, we are able to soak it, store it, we are also able to drain it. Quran says in Surah Hijar chapter 15 verse 22 that we cause fecundating winds, the Arabic word is lavake, coming from the Arabic word lakawa, which means to fecundate. And we know today that the pollen they fecundate the, the clouds and waterfalls, and even clouds join together and water falls from the sky. Quran says in Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 43, that we cause water to rise and form into cloud, and then the rain falls again. Quran says in Surah Rum, chapter number 30, verse 48, that how does the cloud move? It joined together, made into cloud, it moves into the interior and falls down as rain. The Quran speaks about the water cycle in great detail in several verses. In Surah Araf, chapter number 7, verse 57. In Surah Raj, chapter number 13, verse number 17. It's mentioned also in Surah Furqan, chapter 25, verse number 48, 49. It's mentioned in the Quran in Surah Fatir, chapter 35, verse number 9. It's mentioned in Surah Yasin, chapter 36, verse number 34. It's mentioned in Gashia chapter 45, verse number 5. In Surah Qaf chapter 50, verse number 8 and 9. It's mentioned in Surah Waqiyah chapter 56, verse number 16 and 69. It's mentioned in Surah Mul chapter 16, verse number 30. It's mentioned in Surah Tariq chapter number 6, verse number 11. There are several verses which the Quran speaks about the water cycle in great detail. In the subject of geology, the geologists now they tell us that the earth on which we live, the radius is about 3,950 miles. And the deeper layers, they are hot and fluid and cannot sustain life. But superficial layer, it's a thin crust on which we live, hardly one to 10 miles in thickness. And there are high chances that this superficial crust on which we live, it will shake. It is due to the folding phenomena which gives rise to mountain ranges, which gives the stability to the earth. Quran says <coughs> in Surah Naba, chapter number 78, verse number six and, 6 and 7, that we have made the earth as an expanse and the mountains as states. The Quran says, well, Jibala Autada, the mountains as states. That is because Autad means stakes, means tent pegs. When we put a tent into the ground, the tent peg into the ground, the major portion is deep in the ground, only the head is on the top, a superficial portion. Today science tells us that the mountain that we see on top of the earth is only a small portion. The major portion has got deep roots, which give stability to the earth. And one of the famous book on geology, it is called as The Earth, and one of its authors, his name is Frank Press, who was previously the advisor, the scientific advisor to the previous president, oh, 
of USA, Jimmy Carter, and also was the president of Academy of Sciences in USA. He mentions in this book, and he draws the mountains having deep roots like wedges into the ground. And it says the function of the mountain is to prevent the earth from shaking. Exactly what is mentioned in the Quran in Surah Nahal, chapter 16, verse number 5. That we have made on the earth mountain standing firm, lest it would shake with you. And this mention is, is repeated in Surah Luqman, chapter number 31, verse number 10. In Surah Naziyat, chapter 79, verse number 32. In Surah Gasha, chapter number 88, verse number 19. That we have placed on the mountain, we have placed on the earth, mountain standing firm. In the field of oceanology, the glorious Quran says, in Surah Furqan, chapter 25, verse 53, it is Allah who has let free two bodies of flowing water. One sweet and palatable, and the other salty and bitter. Though they meet, they do not mix. There is a barrier which is forbidden to be trespassed. The Quran says in Surah Rahman, chapter 55, verse 19, the Quran says, That it is he who has let free two bodies of flowing water. Though they meet, they do not mix. Previously, the commentators of the Quran, they could not understand what does the Quran mean by saying there are two types of water. They knew there are two types of water, salt and sweet, but they could not understand what does the Quran mean by saying they meet, they do not mix. Today, after science has advanced, we have come to know that whenever one type of water flows into the other type of water, it loses its constituents and gets homogenized into the water it flows. This they call it as the homogenizing barrier, which the Quran calls it as the barzak, the unseen barrier. And this is seen in several places in the world. If you go to South Africa, in the southern tip, that is the Cape Town, there you find, there in the Cape Point, there you find that the two waters meet, even the colors differ between the two. You can see in Egypt, when River Nile flows into the Mediterranean Sea. We can see in the Gulf Stream, which flows for thousands of miles, and both the water are distinct. And if you travel in the Gulf Stream, you'll find, and you pick up water from one side of the stream, it is salty, and the other side, it is sweet. Even the temperature between these two water differs. Further, if you try and analyze, in the subject of biology, I started my talk by quoting a verse of the Quran, which says, وَجَعَلْنَا مِنَ الْمَعِكُ اللَّهِ شَيْنَ أَفَلَا يُمِنُونَ From Surah Anbiya, chapter 21, verse number 30, that we have created every living thing from water. We do not then believe? Imagine in the deserts of Arabia, the Quran says, everything is made from water. Who would have believed in it? Where the scarcity of water the Quran says, everything has been created from water. Today, after science advanced, we have come to know that all living creatures, they have a cell. And its main constituents is the cytoplasm, which contains about 80% water. And today, science tells us that all living creatures, they contain 50 to 90% water. Imagine, Quran mentions this 14 years ago, that we have created every living thing from water. Quran says in Surah Nur, chapter 24, verse 45, we have created every animal from water. Quran says in Surah Furqan, chapter 25, verse 54, we have created every human being from water. In the field of botany, previously we did not know that even the plants had sexes, male and female. Quran says in Surah Taha, chapter number 20, verse number 53, it is Allah who sends on water from the sky. And with it, he brings diverse pairs of plants. Diverse pairs of plants, sexes, male and female. The Arabic word is azwaj. So the Quran says, even the plants have got sexes, male and female. Which today, after science advanced, we have come to know that even the plants have got sexes, male and female. Quran says in Surah Ra, chapter 13, verse number 3, we have created the fruits in pairs. Quran says in Surah Daryat, chapter 41, verse 49, 
in Surah Dariya chapter 51 or 49, that we have created everything in pair. Quran says in Surah Yasin chapter 36 verse 36, that we have created everything in pairs, things you know and things you don't know. Even the things you don't know, we think only the living creatures are in pairs. Today science tells us even electricity has been created in pairs, negative and positive. Even the atoms, protons and neutrons. So the Quran says, Allah has created everything in pairs, the things you know as well as things you don't know. In the field of zoology, the Quran says in Surah Anam, chapter number 6, verse 38, that Allah has created every animal that walks on the earth and every bird that flies in the air to live in communities like the human beings. And today science tells us that even the birds and animals like the human being, they live in communities. It was Safon Fresh who in 1973 got the Nobel Prize for describing the behavior of the bee. And Fawn Fresh said that whenever a bee finds a new flower or a new garden, it goes to its fellow bee and describes the exact location of the new flower or the new garden by a process known as bee dance. The Quran says in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 68 and 69, that the Lord has taught the bee to build its cells in hills, in trees, and in human habitations, and to find the spacious path of the Lord with great skills. So Quran says he has taught the bee to find the spacious path of the Lord with great skill. And today science tells us that the bee can exactly describe the location of the new flower or the new garden by a process known as bee dance. And previously we thought it was the male bee which was the worker bee. No wonder, no wonder Shakespeare in his play, Henry V, he speaks about the soldier bee as being male bee and they report to the king. Today science has advanced and we have come to know it is not the male bee which is the worker bee, it is the female bee. And they don't report to the king, but they report to the queen. And science, and if you read the Quran, Quran says in Surah Nahal, chapter 16, verse 68 and 69, the gender of the female bee is fasluki or kulli, meaning a female bee. So imagine the Quran specifies the gender of the worker bee as being female, which science has come to know recently. Quran says in Surah Ankabut, chapter 29, verse 41, that as to those who took for protectors, anyone besides Allah, they build for themselves houses like that of the spider. And verily, the house of the spider is fragile. Besides Quran saying that those who take for protectors, anyone besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, their house being delicate and fragile like that of the spider, it even talks about the relationship. And today science tells us that the family relationship of the spider, many a times the female spider kills the male spider and is called as the black widow. So Quran says that if you take for protector, anyone besides Allah, besides the house being fragile, it talks about the relationship of the family also. Quran says in Surah Namal, Quran says in Surah Namal chapter 27, verse number 17 and 18, that when Solomon, and his army with host of men, jinns, and birds. When they approached a lowly valley of ants, one of the ants said, O ye ants, get into your habitations, lest Solomon and army will trample you beneath the feet. People may think, what kind of a fairy tale book is the Quran? The ants talking among themselves? They sound like a fairy tale book. Today, after science advanced, we have come to know that the animal or insect which has the closest resemblance to that of the human being is the ant. The ant buries the dead the same way as we human beings do. They have a sophisticated method of labor where they have a supervisor, a foreman, they have a worker. They very often meet to chat. They have a sophisticated method of communication. They even have marketplaces where they exchange goods. You know how we have market, we have the souk. 
And when we see, very often when it rains, and if the ant stores the grain, and if the grain gets wet, you may see, you know, when I was a kid, I used to see that the ants carrying the grain in the sunlight. I used to wonder where they're going. Today, science tells us that the ant gets the grain in the sunlight to dry as though they knew that humidity will cause the rotting of the grain. And if the grain had buds, they chopped the bud as though they knew that budding will cause the rotting of the grain. Imagine, Quran speaks about the lifestyle of the ant 1400 years ago, which we came to recently. In the field of medicine, the Quran says in Surah Nahal, chapter 16, verse 68 and 69, that from the belly of the bee, we give you drink of varying colors in which there is healing for humankind. Previously, we did not know that honey was obtained from the bee, from the belly of the bee. We came to know a few hundred years back. And today, science tells us that the honey is rich in fructose and vitamin K, and it has got mild antiseptic properties. No wonder the Russian soldiers in World War II, they used honey to cover up their wound. And today science tells us that due to the density of the honey, fungus and bacteria is prevented to grow in the wound, and there is healing of the wound without leaving scar tissue. And if a person has an allergy to a particular plant, and if honey obtained from that plant is given, that person starts developing resistance to that allergy. Imagine the Quran says, in the honey, there is healing for humankind, which science has come to know recently. In the field of physiology, there's a particular verse which speaks about the blood circulation and the production of milk in a nutshell. Quran says in Surah Nahal, chapter 16, verse number 66, that verily in the cattle is a lesson for you. We give you to drink from what is within the body, coming from a conjunction between the blood and the constituents of the intestine, milk which is pure for you to drink. This verse of the Quran describes the blood circulation and the production of milk in a nutshell. Today, after science advance, we have come to know that whatever we eat goes into the stomach, then to the intestine, and from the intestine it goes to the various organs of the body via the bloodstream, and many a time to the complicated method of the liver. It even enters the mammary glands which are responsible for the production of milk. And the Quran speaks about the blood circulation and production of milk in a nutshell, which we came to recently. In the field of hemorrhology, in the early 1980s and late 1970s, that's more than 35 years back, there were a group of Arabic students, <clears throat> there was a group of Arab students who followed the verse of the Quran, which says, Fas alu ahle zikri in kumdulatalamu. In Surah Nahal, chapter 16, verse 43, that if you don't know, ask the person who's knowledgeable. So they collected all the verses of the Quran and the hadith that they knew that deals with embryology, and they presented to Professor Keith Moore, who at that time was the highest authority in the field of embryology. He was head of the anatomy department in the University of Canada in Toronto. And when he was presented with the translation of these verses, he said, and he was asked to comment, what are your views regarding these verses in the Quran and the Hadith which talks about embryology? So he said, that most of the verses in the Quran are in conformity with modern science, but some I cannot say that they are right, neither can I say they are wrong because I myself don't know. And two such verses were the first two verses of the Quran to be revealed in the Quran, sorry, Ikhra, chapter number, chapter number nine, six, verse number one and two, which says, Ikhra bismi rabbikal lazi khalaq, khalaq al insana min alaq. Read, recite, and proclaim in the name of the Lord who created you. Who created you from an alaka, a congealed clot of blood, a leech-like substance. So Prophet Keith Moore said, I do not know whether the embryo looks like a leech or not. So he went into his laboratory, and under a very powerful microscope, he observed the early stages of an embryo and compared it with a photograph of a leech, and he was astonished at the striking resemblance. And when about 80 questions were asked to him, 
And he replied to them and he said, if you would have asked me these questions 50 years back, he said in 19, 1980, I would not be able to answer more than 50% because embryology at that time was a new branch of medicine. Today, because embryology has advanced, I can answer and confirm that what is mentioned in the Quran and the Hadith is in perfect conformity with modern embryology. <clears throat> Further, it says in Surah Hajj, chapter 20, verse number 5, and Surah Mu'minun, chapter number 23, verse number 12 to 14, that we have created the human beings from anutfa, a minute quantity of liquid. And today, science tells us that only one sperm is sufficient to fertilize the ovum. Minute quantity. Quran says in Surah Sajda, chapter 32, verse number 8, that we have created the human beings from asolala, the best part of the whole. Solala in Arabic means the best part of whole. And today science tells us out of the 300 million sperm emitted in normal ejaculation, only one sperm is sufficient to fertilize the ovum. And Quran refers to as solala, the best part of the whole. <clears throat> Furthermore, it's mentioned in the Quran in Surah Tariq, chapter number 86, verse number 5 to 7. Does not man think from what is created? He is created from a drop emitted from a space between the backbone and the ribs. What does the Quran mean that human beings have been created from a drop emitted between the backbone and the ribs? Today, science, after being advanced, has come to know that, that the genital organs in the male, the testes, in the female, the ovaries, they originate from a space where the kidney is present between the backbone and the 11th and 12th rib. And later on in the embryonic life, embryology means the study of the child in the womb of the mother. In the embryonic age, while the human being is in the womb of the mother, these genital organs, the testes and the ovaries, they descend, and in the male, where the inguinal canal, canal go into the scrotum, and the male, they descend to the two pelvis. But even after the descent, even today in the adult life, they get the blood supply from the same space between the backbone and the 11th and 12th rib. And the venous returns, goes back to the same space between the, between the spinal column and the 11th and 12th rib. Even the nerve supply comes from that. Imagine, the Quran says this 1,400 years ago. Does not man think from what is created? He's created from a drop emitted from a space between the backbone and the ribs. In the field of embryology, specifically in the field of genetics, today science tells us that, you know where I come from, that's India, people normally prefer having sons rather than daughters and for reason known best to them. Today, science has advanced, and we have come to know it is the 23rd pair of chromosome which is responsible for the sex of the child. If it's XX, it's a female. If it's XY, then it's a male. And today, science tells us that it is the male which is responsible for deciphering the sex of the child. If the X of the male takes part in fertilization, then a female is born. If the Y takes part in fertilization, then a male is born. Quran says this 1400 years ago in Surah Najm, chapter number 53, verse number 45 to 46, that we have created the human beings and made them into sex, male and female, from a minute quantity which is ejaculated from the male. Quran says in Surah Insan, chapter number 75, verse number 37 to 39, that we have created the human beings from a minute quantity of sperm, then made it into sex, male and female. So Quran mentions 1400 years ago that it is the male which is responsible for, for the sex of the child, not the female, which science has confirmed it today. So if, you know, in the country many a times, as I told you, that if the daughter gives birth, to a female, the mother-in-law gets angry with the daughter-in-law. But Quran and science says it is the male which is responsible. So if she has to get angry, she has to get angry with the son and not with the daughter-in-law. 
it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who decides whether it's a male or a female. Furthermore, Quran says in Surah Sajda, chapter number 32, verse number 9, that we have given the faculty of hearing and sight. So Quran says, first comes the sense of hearing, then comes the sense of sight. And really science tells us, the first sense to develop is the sense of hearing by the fifth month of pregnancy. And then the eye opens in the ninth month of pregnancy. And that's the reason even you see in the hadith of a beloved Prophet he said that when a woman is pregnant, she should do good things, hear good things, recite the Quran. And today science tells us that the hearing comes earlier and the child in the womb of the mother can also hear. And there was an experiment done uh, in US that, ten, that there were 10 children taken. One child was of a typist. So many years back, you know, when they have to have manual typewriter. Manual typewriter, tuck, 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 noise to come. So they took one child who was newly born to a typist mother. That was 50 years back in manual typewriter. And the remaining nine were of normal mothers. And when all these 10 children were born, and in front of them, when they again started typing, nine children got scared. But the child of the typist was used to hearing in the mother's womb. <laughs> so that child did not get scared. So the Quran confirms, first come the sense of hearing, then come the sense of sight. So always, as the Hadith says, that when a woman is pregnant, she should do good things, your good things, so that even your child, inshallah, will be good. Due to shortage of time, I will just mention two more scientific facts before I end my talk so that we can have a longer time for a question and answer session. Quran says in Surah Insan, chapter number 75, verse number 3 and 4, that when the unbelievers ask, how will Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be able to reconstruct our bones on the day of judgment? When we have died, when we have got buried, and our bones have got disintegrated, how will your God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, be able to reconstruct the bones on the day of judgment? So Allah says, tell them Allah can not only reconstruct the bones, he can even reconstruct in perfect order the very tips of your finger. What does the Quran mean by saying Allah can not only reconstruct the bones, he can even reconstruct the very tip of your finger. It was in 1880 that Sir Francis Gold, he discovered the fingerprinting method. That no two fingerprints, even in a million people, are identical. And today the CIA, the police, the CIA, they use the fingerprinting method to identify. Imagine, Quran mentions about the fingerprinting method 1400 years ago, that Allah can not only reconstruct the bones, he can even reconstruct in perfect order the very tips of the finger. I would like to end the talk by giving the last example. There are you know, thousands of verses in the Quran, more than a thousand verses which speak about science. I'll just give you one more example about the scientific fact mentioned in the Quran. There was a professor by the name of Tagla Tagashan in Thailand, and he spent a great deal of time in doing research on pain. And today, previously the doctors, the medical doctors, they thought only the brain was responsible for the feeling of pain. And recently they have come to know that there are certain things, there are certain receptors in the pain which are responsible for the feeling of pain. Without the pain receptors, the pain cannot be felt. That is the reason today, if a person has a burn injury, the doctor takes a pin and pricks it in the area of burn. If the patient feels pain, the doctor is happy. It's a superficial burn. The pain receptors are intact. If the patient does not feel pain, the doctor is sad. It's a deep burn. The pain receptors have been destroyed. So to, to this Prophet Takarashan, there was a verse of the Quran showed to him from Surah Nisa, chapter number four, verse 56, which says, as to those who reject our signs, we shall cast them into the hellfire. And as often as their skins are roasted, we shall give them fresh skin so that they shall feel the pain. 
When Prophet Takarashan read the verse of the Quran, he could not believe. How could this book, 1400 years ago, talk about that if the skin is roasted, you will not feel the pain, talking about pain receptors? He could not believe that how could a book 14 years ago talk about that? So he later on deconfirmed the translation of the verses. And he spoke with other professors and scientists, including Prophet Keith Moore. And he was so impressed with the Quran, which is talking about pain receptors, and he has spent a great deal of his life in doing research on this, he was so impressed that in the eighth medical conference in Riyadh, in the conference itself, he said the Shada. And he said that La ilaha illallah, there is no God but Allah, and Muhammad Rasulullah, that Prophet Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. With this, I end my speech. Wa akhirat dawana, alhamdulillah, rabbil alamin. Thank you very much for the oration just now. And I would like to invite members of the floor to post any question that uh, you have in mind in regards of the oration that was just delivered, please. Now we come to the second part of the program, which is much more interesting than the first part, which is a dialogue. If anyone has any questions regarding the topic Quran and modern science, conflict or conciliation, you're most welcome to ask any questions. We would request that if there are any non-Muslims in the audience, I know that Perlis has, mashallah, more than 85% Muslims, but if there are any non-Muslims in the audience, we'd like to give them the first opportunity. And for non-Muslims, they can ask any question on the topic, outside the topic, also no problem. Please keep your questions brief in two or three sentences. If it's more than that, it becomes a lecture. <laughs> Please mention your name and your profession, so I'll be in a better position to reply. And please ask one question at a time. For a second question, you can go behind the queue. So if there are any questions that anyone would like to ask, you're most welcome to make a queue. I think there are two microphones kept here, one for the ladies and one for the gents. So if anyone has any questions, they're most welcome to come to the microphone and ask the question. If there are any non-Muslims, they shall be given the first opportunity. Anyone had any question, you're most welcome to disagree with me. But you have to tell me why you disagree with me. And I'll try my level best to reply to you. OK, Doctor, we have one here. Ladies first, yes, thank you. Yes, um, thank you for your lecture. Um, my name is Ayame from Japan, and I, I want to ask you a question about the evolution that is, uh, I learned in my high school as a scientific fact, but I found out that in Islam it is like, the prohibited things, or it is haram to think about the evolution because uh, in Quran it is said that the God created a human. And also there the, we have a Pokemon in my country, but <laughs> <laughs> in Saudi Arabia or UAE or Qatar, it is there the, the, the fatwa was issued that the Pokemon is prohibited. So I feel so, uh, I was wondering why it is so sensitive topic about the evolution and how the Muslim. What is prohibited? The Pokemon. Sorry, I don't understand the word. <laughs> what? what, what? Uh, I, just, I, I, I just. What is prohibited? You said. Uh, the the concept of evolution. Concept of evolution. Yes. Evolution. So I was wondering why it is so sensitive topic and how the Muslim people are deal with it. That deal with. So still asks a very common question, and like her, even I studied in my school and university about the Darwin's theory, that human beings have been evolved from ape. The sister, if you analyze what we learned in school was Darwin's theory, the theory of evolution. There is no book I have read so far called, which is titled The Fact of Evolution. It is theory of evolution. And in the beginning of my talk, I said, I will not be talking about theories and hypotheses because many a times, Theories and hypotheses take your turn. If you read this book of Darwin, by the name of Origin of Species, and it says in this book that Darwin, 
he traveled to an island by the name of Calatropis, and on a ship by the H my ship by the HMS Beagle, and he saw that the birds, they pecked in niches. And depending upon the niches they pecked, the beak became long and short. Based on this, he propounded his theory of natural selection. And Darwin himself knew that there were missing links. There were missing links. That's the reason in our school, if we had to insult someone, we used to say that if you were present at Darwin's time, his theory would have been proved right, insinuating that the person looks like an ape. What Darwin said, and wrote a letter to his friend Thomas Thompson, that he doesn't believe in natural selection because he has got inevitable proof. It helps him in classification, and it helps him in describing. There were missing links. Today we know that there are four types of hominoids. We have the Australopithecus, we have the Cro-Magnon, we have the Neanderthal man, and we know that there is no direct link between them. And according to P.P. Grasse, who held the chair of the study in the Chaudhon University in Paris, he said, it is letting your imagination run too wild to claim that our ancestors were apes. Just based on study of few vestiges, this is just an assumption. Because there is no knowledge of the fact, we are taught Darwin's theory as though it's a fact. Further, if you read in the theory of biological biology, Hans S. Craig, the scientist says, it is absurd to think that our DNA was formed from apes. And there are many scientists, if you go to a website, we just type scientist against Darwin theory, you will find more than a thousand scientists who have signed that they disagree with Darwin's theory. More than a thousand. But because they don't know the fact, it is yet taught as though it's a fact. So there are missing links. And according to various scholars and various scientists, they say the probability of you know, the DNA of human being coming from ape is like a tornado coming in a yard and, and all the scraps being kept. The tornado comes and goes away and a jumbo jet 747 has been created by the And what are the chances? The other scientists say that if you pick up millions of letters and you keep on putting one, any picking up at random and placing them, an encyclopedia of thousands of pages will come into order with exact meaning and definition. The chances are less than that. So all these are hypotheses, sister. Today, the science doesn't agree that Darwin's theory is a fact. But because they don't have an alternative, they teach it as a fact. And in our school, we have a school, Islamic International School, and it's an international school from the IGCC syllabus. And even we have to teach Javanese theory because they're in the syllabus. So we tell our Muslim students, we teach them exactly what is there in the book. So the teacher correcting doesn't think that our students don't know about Darwin's theory. So we write the answer, full answer, then we write but. Then we mention, according to latest research, and then we give the answer, blah, blah, blah. So they write a double answer. First, they write exactly what is mentioned in the textbook. Then we write the other research. So no teacher can say that the student doesn't know. And then we give the right facts of so many scientists have said, blah, 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 blah. And if you hear my tape, there is a detailed answer which is only given on, on this chair of evolution. This, in short, I hope that yeah. the answer the question. It's only a theory. It's not a fact. We believe that alhamdulillah the human beings have been created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the first man on the face of the earth is Adam, peace be upon him. And from that, the humanity was created. That's called the creation, not the evolution. Hope that answers the question. But that doesn't mean that everything what Darwin said is wrong. Darwin said that everything is made from water, which the Quran says. So that doesn't mean everything what Darwin says is wrong. Only that assumption that we have been created from ape is wrong. But many things Darwin said is right about 
you mean that the living creatures are made from water, that there are certain changes in behavior, etc. Yes, we agree with that. But to say that we have been created from A based on these assumptions is totally wrong. Hope that answers the question. Okay, thank you very much. You're most welcome. Okay, thank you. And next. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Gave. I'm from Iraq, PhD student in computer science from UUM. Uh, I would like to ask you about computer science was built depend on the simulation between human functions and at the same time artificial intelligence as a field from computer science already defined depend on the simulation of function of human beings. So my question, did you find verses from the Holy Quran define the relationship between information technology or computer science and the human beings? This is the question that did I find anything in the Quran between computer science and human beings? <laughs> if you noted, in the beginning of my talk, I said, Quran is not a book of science, S-C-I-E-N-C-E. -E. It's a book of signs, S-I-G-N-S. There's a lot of information that is in the Quran. If you ask me, does the Quran say 2 plus 2 is equal to 4? I don't know any verse in the Quran which says 2 plus 2 is equal to 4. That does not mean 2 plus 2 is not equal to 4. So everything of science is not in the Quran, but whatever Quran has said, there is not a single verse of the Quran which goes against established science. So Quran is not a book of science, but everything what is mentioned about science is 100% perfect. You ask him about computer science, there are, and if I have to link it with computer, I do believe that though computer science says that trying to get an artificial intelligence, but Allah's creation of the human being is far superior than the computer. And there have been many a times competition between human beings and the computer. And if you've, and if you've heard of the famous mathematician from India, Shakuntala Devi, she had a competition with the fastest computer and they gave an equation which was very long and she defeated the computer with, I think, 10 or 20 seconds. So the human being, what Allah has made the God-given computer, is far superior than a normal computer. But when you're talking about maths, let me link it the closest we can think about, you know, a computer and, 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 and intelligence, that can you think that the Quran is computer coded, for example. The basis of mathematics was first propounded by Aristotle, who said that every statement can either be true or false. So the base, the foundation of mathematics is on the statement of Aristotle, every statement can be true or false. So one person came and asked the question, what if this statement is false? Every statement can be true or false. What if this statement is false? Whole mathematics collapsed. <laughs> then they came up with a rule that whenever you say something, it either meaning-wise or mentioning-wise. Meaning-wise or mentioning-wise. You say something, either meaning-wise or mentioning-wise. Just to give you a small example, that does the Quran contain any contradictions? Who says that Quran doesn't contain contradictions? Raise your hand. Who says Quran doesn't contain contradiction? Any ikhtilaf, raise your hand. Who says Quran doesn't contain contradictions? Raise your hand. Quran doesn't contain ikhtilaf, raise your hand. So most of you all think that Quran contains contradiction. Who says Quran, Quran contains contradiction? Raise your hand. I know that's easier to ask. I always ask the opposite so that people who are tired, they get up first. Who says Quran contains contradiction? Raise your hand. No one. Who says Quran contains iktilaf? Raise your hand. No one. I am raising my hand. I am telling 
that Quran contains contradiction. You say, what, Dr. Zakin, I gave a lecture for about an hour, and now he says Quran contains contradiction? Yes, Quran contains. Quran contains iktilaf. Open the Quran, Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 82 says, a fala is the Buran Quran. Walau kana minin di gerila la vajadu fi iktilafan kasira. Do not the unbelievers, do you not ponder the Quran with care? Had it been from anyone besides Allah, there would have been many contradictions. The word contradiction is there in the Quran. <laughs> so all of you are wrong, I am right. Does the Quran contain contradiction, yes or no? Mentioning wise, yes. Meaning wise, no. Mentioning wise? The Quran says, Afala yadabbarun al Quran. Walau kana min indi gairilla la wajadu fiktilafan kasira. Do they not consider the Quran with care? Had it been from anyone besides Allah, there would have been contradictions. Many contradictions. So now, meaning wise, we know there is no contradiction, not a single. But mentioning wise, there is. That means meaning wise the Quran is right, mentioning wise the Quran is no. Even mentioning wise Quran is not wrong. Why? It says iktilafan kasira. Many contradictions. You read the full Quran, the word contradiction is only one. The Quran says, had the Quran been from anyone besides Allah, there would have been many contradictions. Iktilafan kasira. So even mentioning wise the Quran is not wrong. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taken care that mentioning wise there is only one. So meaning wise there is no contradiction. We know that. But if someone wants to attack the Quran and prove it wrong, mentioning wise also they cannot do it. Let me give you one more example. Quran says in Surah Maida chapter 5 verse number 100. That all those who reject our signs are like dogs. All those who reject our signs are like dogs. That means all those who reject the signs of Almighty God, they are like dogs. Is there any problem in that? Meaning wise, no problem. Mentioning wise, if you count in the Quran, all those who reject our signs is mentioned five times, and kalb, dog, is also mentioned five times. So meaning wise, it is correct. All those reject our signs are like dogs. Even mentioning wise, five times, all those reject our signs, dogs is also five times. If you see, if you read the Quran says in Surah Imran, chapter 3, verse 49, Inna masala isa in the like a misal adam. Khalaqa min turab, summa kala lukun fayakun. The similitude of Jesus in front of Adam is the same. The similitude of Jesus in front of Allah is the same like Adam, peace be upon him. Allah said, Kun fayakun, be and it was. So we know the example that when people say, you know, that Jesus is almighty God because he had no father. So Allah says, Adam, peace be upon him, had no mother and no father. The example of Jesus, peace be upon him, is like Adam. Allah said, Kun fayakun. So meaning wise, we know that Isa alayhi salam was created by miracle of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Adam a.s. was created from the miracle of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But when it says, Inna masala isa in the lahi kamasala Adam, the similitude of Adam and Jesus is the same. If you count Isa a.s. in the Quran, whole Quran, it is mentioned 25 times. If you count Adam a.s. in the whole Quran, even that is mentioned 25 times. So, meaning wise, it is correct, mentioning wise, it is correct. Quran says that zulumat is not like noor, darkness is not like light. Meaning why that's correct. If you count zulumat, I think it is about 13 times and noor is about 12 times. So meaning wise, it is not same, even counting wise it's not same. Now you are talking about mathematical code. Not only when the Quran says in Surah Imran chapter 3 verse 49, in the muscle, Isa, in the like, Amr Saladam. The 25 times Isa alayhi salam, 25 times Adam alayhi salam. If you count from Surah Fatiha till Surah Imran chapter 3 verse 49, Isa alayhi salam is mentioned the seventh time. Even Adam alayhi salam is mentioned seventh time. So if you have to jumble and put maybe Surah Fatiha in the middle and maybe Surah Nas, in the starting, this code would be 
disrupted. So today, if we analyze the Quran with computer, it is impossible for a human being to write a book which is meaning-wise correct and mentioning-wise also correct with so many different, different messages. So this word, the glorious Quran, this book, the glorious Quran, cannot be from a human being, has to be from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if you put the Quran to the test of computer, even a computer to create this would be impossible. So this is the closest I can think that if you want to analyze the Quran through a computer, so anything if you read, there are many examples, you can give a lecture only on, on, on the mathematical code that the Quran has. Yes, brother. I, I, I found one uh, verse from the Holy Quran talking about the simulation. The ayah in uh, Surah Al-Nahl, uh, Allah said, subhanahu wa ta'ala, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, wa fi anfusikum afala tatafakkaroon. That means we should thinking about ourselves or themselves functions. So uh, I think this verse push us to thinking about the simulation, how we can make the simulation between the human being functions, and how, how we can use these functions to help the human. Yes, thinking about the similarity, there are many verses. Quran says, Afala yuminun, will you not then believe? The Quran is meant for those men of understanding. So like that, there are many verses which tell you to ponder upon the human. And the Quran says, this book is for the men of understanding. So Quran, the beauty of the Quran is that one verse, it has a variety of meaning. It can satisfy an intellectual, a scientist, and it even can satisfy a layman who's uneducated. The beauty of the Quran is, that the same verse can satisfy a variety of people. The same verse, it is the best Arabic literature. The same verse is a miracle. The same verse is science. Tomorrow there may be another age of I don't know what. So Quran, the beauty of the Quran is, it proves itself to be the word of God in all the ages. That is the beauty of the Quran. That today is not the age of literature and poetry. Yet, it is the best Arabic literature. At the same time, it is scientific. Tomorrow, maybe after 100 years, the science will not carry much weight. Like today, poetry doesn't carry much weight. So whichever age comes, the beauty of the Quran is it will prove itself to be the word of God in all the ages. Hope that answers the question. Thank you so much. For Thank you. Most welcome. Good morning. I'm Shivlila from India. Uh, here I have a question. You started with uh, your speech with the statement that Islam is a latest religion or a revolution in the religion. And uh, if it is a latest religion, what would be the earlier religion to before this Islam? And same thing goes with the Holy Quran. If it is the latest one, there must be something before the Quran uh, which tells about God and the rules what we have to follow to reach to the God's place. Sister asked a question that I said in my lecture that Islam is the latest religion and it's a revolution. There's a size misunderstanding. I never ever said Islam is the latest religion. I said Sorry. Quran is the last revelation, not revolution. Okay. And Islam is not the latest religion, it's the first religion. Okay, before that one, before there were people, before the uh, Islam, there are many religions or many this one. What would be those, what would be the rules of that religion or what would be the... Sister, thing? there's a misconception amongst most of the human being that Islam is a new religion that came 1400 years ago mm. and Prophet Muhammad is the founder of the religion of Islam, peace be upon him. This is totally wrong. Islam is there since time immemorial, since man set foot on the earth. And Prophet Muhammad is not the founder of the religion of Islam. He is the last and final messenger of Allah. So there's a misconception that Islam did not come 14 years back. Islam came since man set foot on the earth. Since. Tens and thousands. And Islam is the first religion and the only religion. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Imran, chapter 3, verse 19, Inna dina in the Lail Islam, the only religion acceptable 
in the sight of Almighty God is Islam. Islam means submitting your will to God. Come from the Arabic word sil. So you ask me the question, what were the rules before Islam? There was no human being before Islam. So all the messengers, Adam, peace be upon him, Noah, Abraham, uh, Jesus, and Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. By name, 25 are mentioned in the Quran. But our beloved Prophet said there were 124,000 messengers sent on the face of the earth. So, according to Islam, Islam is the only one religion that Almighty God sent. But by passage of time, people kept on changing it. So whenever they changed, another messenger came and prophet, another prophet was sent. Okay. So according to the hadith, Sahih hadith, in Mishkat al-Masabi, it says that there were 124,000 messengers sent on the face of the earth. Every nation was sent a messenger. By name, only 25 are mentioned. As the message changed, Almighty God sent a new messenger. So when it got changed, it became into a new religion. But the true religion is only one, which is Islam. Islam means submitting a will to God. Islam comes from the root word salam, means peace. So Islam means peace acquired by submitting a will to God. So what you find today, religion is only one by Almighty God. And if you do a survey system in all the major religions today, whether it be Hinduism, Judaism, Christianity, all these religions, what I tell a person, not me, that there are hundreds and thousands of religions today, correct sister? Yes. I give a common solution, which will which everyone would accept. Mm. If only I accept and you don't accept, what is the use, correct? Yeah. Let's come. So Quran says in Surah Imran, chapter 3, verse 64, ila kalimatin sawa im baina baina kum. Come to common terms as between us and you. So I tell a person, okay, let us agree that one book is 100% the word of God and authentic. So the Hindu will say, I don't mind believing Veda to be the word of God. Yeah. Okay. The Christian will say, I don't mind believing Bible to be the word of God. The Jew will say, I don't mind believing Torah to be the word of God. The Muslim will say, I don't mind believing Quran to be the word of God. So no fighting, correct? I give a common solution. You know, when I was in school, I learned about the Venn diagram. Venn diagram means there are two circles. Yes. What is common, mm -hmm. it belongs to both. Yes. There can be three circles. Yes. So I give a simple solution. Let's not fight. Let us agree what is common in all these scriptures. What is common? Let us follow. What is not common, we will not fight. We will discuss tomorrow. But let us agree to follow what is common. I am not here to bring division. I am here to unite. But what has happened, every religion has this dharma guru, you know? Yeah, yeah. That they yes, make yes. advantage for them. Yes. So that, you know, if everyone follows me, mm. I'll become rich, I'll become popular. I tell why I'm not here. I'm, I'm no dharma guru. I'm only a student. So I give a solution that let us agree what is common in all the scripture. Mm. I'm not saying only follow Quran. Mm. Muslims, you want to follow? Okay, I want to follow. Let us agree to follow what is common in Quran, in Veda, mm. in Bible, in Torah. What is not common, we'll discuss tomorrow, right or wrong. So I've given a lecture on concept of God in major world religion. Now when we study the scripture, when you, when you read Read the way. You're a Hindu, correct? Yeah, Sister? I am a Hindu. Yes, yeah, so Hindu, Hindu by definition means a person living in India. Yeah. So by definition, I'm yeah, also I'm Hindu. I'm from India. <laughs> I'm also from India. <laughs> <laughs> but Swami Vivekananda said the right word should be Vedantis, those who follow the Vedas. Yes. Now, if you read the Veda, if you read the Veda, and if you read the Upanishad, the scriptures of the Hinduism, Upanishad, Vedas, if you read the Chandogya Upanishad, chapter number six, Section number two, verse number one. Ikkam ivdityam. God is only one without a second. Mm. It's further mentioned in the Sveta Sveta Upanishad, chapter number six, verse number nine. Nacha se kase janita na chadipa. Of that God, he has got no superior. He has got no father. He has no got no mother. mother. Mm. It's mentioned in the Sveta Sveta Upanishad, chapter number four, verse number 19. Mm. And in Rajurubay, chapter number 32, verse number three. It says, Pratima Asti. Of that God, there is no Pratima. Mm. Pratima in Sanskrit means idol. photograph, yes. picture, mm. idol, mm. painting. Yes. Uh, so uh, 
Natasipatimasti of that God, there is no pratima, there is no picture, there is no painting, there is no idol, there is no sculpture, there is no photograph. Who says that? Veda. Yajurved chapter 32, verse number 2. Correct? Yeah. So you as a Hindu should believe in that. Forget what the Quran says. Correct? You have to believe there is only one God. Yeah. You should believe God has got no idol, God has got no picture, God has got no painting. Correct? Yes. You have to believe. I tell the Christian. It's mentioned in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 6, verse number 4. It says, Shama Israelo adna hen adna khad. Israel, the Lord, our God is one Lord. Moses said that in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6, verse number 4. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said in the Gospel of Mark, chapter number 12, verse 29. So let us believe that God is one. It's mentioned in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 5, verse number 7. It says that thou shall have no other God besides me. Thou shall have no other graven image of anything, of any likeness, in the heaven above, in the earth beneath, in the water beneath the earth. Thou shalt not bow down to them, nor serve them. For I, thy God, thy Lord is a jealous God. So Judaism says that, Christianity says that, God is one, God has got no idol. What is in the Quran? If you ask a Muslim, what is the definition of God? Allah, the best reply I can give you Surah class. Chapter number 112, verse number 1 to 4. Kulu Allah wahad, Allah hu samad. Lam ilid wa lam ilid wa lam yukul loku fanad. Say there is God one and only. He begets not nor is he begotten. He is absolute and eternal. He begets not nor is he begotten. And there is nothing like him. So now Quran says that, Veda says that, Torah says that, Bible says that God is one. God has got no idol. God has got no image. We have to worship him only. So when I tell the Hindu, why do you do idol worship? So Hindus are against me. Why? I'm telling, I'm quoting Sanskrit. And the Hindus of Malaysia are more against me than the Hindus of India. <laughs> you know, they give me free publicity here. So I'm asking, am I telling something against? I'm saying, come to common terms. Oh, Zakir is dividing people. Where am I dividing? I'm uniting. I'm not telling you to come and join me. I'm just a student. And I have discussion with the Dharma Guru. You know Shishi Ravi Shankar? Yes. He is the one of the most popular Hindu spiritual leader in the world. When I have discussion with him on the stage, oh. correct? I have a discussion with him. It's in recording. So I am telling, I am not come here to divide, I am come here to unite. Then I tell them, it is mentioned in your scripture. If you read Kalki Avatar, you know Kalki Avatar? Yes. If you read Kalki Purana. Mm. Kalki Purana, it says in Kalki Purana, chapter number 2, verse number 5, 7, 9, 11, 14. I'm giving references. That there is an Akri Avatar to mm. come, yes. whose father's name will be Vishnu Yas. Mm -hmm. Vishnu means God, Yas means servant, servant of God. The name of the father of Prophet Muhammad was Abdullah, servant of God. Who says that? Kalki Purana. Not the Quran. Mm -hmm. It says the mother's name will be Sumati. Sumati means peace, serenity. The name of the mother of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was peace, serenity. He'll be born in the village of Sambal, the village of peace, Makkah. He'll be born in the tribe of the leader of Makkah. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was born in the family of Quraysh. He will get enlightenment in a cave. He got in Garahira. He will migrate northwards and come back. Prophet Muhammad migrated northward to Medina and came back. He'll have four very close friends, the four Khulfa Rashadid. Who says that? Kalki Avatar. This is not in the Quran. Do you know Quran doesn't say that? Quran doesn't speak about, about the four friends. That's been the Hadith. We believe in it. But it is then Kalki Purana. Detail. So when your scripture says, that the Kalki Avatar is going to come. Why don't you believe in the Kalki Avatar? Sister, can you tell me who is this Kalki Avatar? No scripture. Avatar. Tenth, no. Yeah, tenth Avatar of Vishnu, we believe like that. Tenth Avatar of Vishnu, which is the last one huh. who, is to, who will come to this huh, Who earth. will come? Who is he? I don't know. I'm helping you. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I agree with I've read your scriptures. I'm not arguing your scriptures right or wrong. You are a Hindu. You believe, you follow. You tell me anything from the Quran, any verse, from any of the 114 chapters, whether you like it or don't like it. You may not believe. You tell Dr. Zakir, you are a Muslim. Why don't you follow chapter number so and so, verse number so and so? If I don't, I will say I'm wrong. I'll follow it. 
Because I believe Quran to be the word of God. When you believe Vedas and the Hindu scripture to be the word of God, why don't you follow? Am I here to divide or unite? Unite. So please, can you tell to your Hindu friend here? <laughs> sure, sure. I, I have come to Malaysia to unite the Hindu Muslim, not to divide. But the problem is that no one will follow the Hindu leader here. You are seeing in India, mashallah, I give lectures in large audiences, and on average 25% are non-Muslims, are about Hindu. Mm -hmm. In Bombay, when I gave a lecture to 300,000 people, mashallah, 75,000 were Hindus. Hundreds of thousands of Hindus come, and we give first opportunity to non-Muslim. Most of these people, they come, they ask questions, they may agree, they may disagree. So my question again, sister, do you believe there's one God? Yes. Do you I believe idol worship is wrong? Yes. I Very believe. good. Do you believe that Prophet Muhammad is the last and final messenger which is mentioned in your Kalki Avatar? Yes. I you believe? believe? Yes. Khalas. The two yes. minimum thing required, sister, <laughs> for anyone to become a Muslim, the two basic criteria required for any human being to be a Muslim is first to agree there is one God who has got no idols. Second is to believe Prophet Muhammad is a messenger. See, when you take admission in a school, you require a criteria. Mm -hmm. Then you may go from nursery to junior mm -hmm. KG to first standard to second standard, third standard. To enter the school of Islam, the only true religion, is to believe there's one God and to believe Prophet Muhammad is a messenger. So according to me, you're a Muslim sister. <laughs> if you believe there's one God, yes. correct? Yes. And if you believe that idol worship is wrong, yes. and you believe Prophet Muhammad is a messenger, that is the basic requirement to be a Muslim. Then you may get second class, first class, distinction, that is later. But minimum for anyone to be a Muslim is to believe in these two things. And Muslim, again, doesn't mean your name should be Zakir, Sultan, Muhammad. <laughs> Muslim is a person who submits his will to God. Submits his will to God. So I'm asking the question, sister, I have come here to unite. You tell me anything from the Quran. Look, you're talking big lectures. Okay, why don't you follow this verse of the Quran chapter? And if I'm not following, I will start following. Correct? What I'm here to come and find the commonalities between the Hindu scriptures, <laughs> between the Bible. And if I'm wrong, you can come and tell me I'm wrong. I'm a human being. I can make a mistake. But tell me where my mistake is. Just by writing articles that Zakir has come to divide, Zakir is a terrorist, Zakir is doing money laundering. <laughs> by this, can I tell Vedas are the base for the Quran or the uh, rules for the Islam? See, what you have to realize, yeah. Almighty God, hmm. it says in Surah Raj, chapter 13, <coughs> verse 38, that the Kulli Ajilin Kitab, in every age, there was a revelation. This is the verse of the Quran that Allah has sent several revelations. By name, only four are mentioned. Torah, Zabur, Injil, and the Quran. Mm. But there were many which is not mentioned. You are asking me, can you say it is the base of the Quran? Not for sure. Because the name is not mentioned. We believe that Injil was the wahi given to Isa alayhi salam. Zabur was the wahi given to David, peace be upon him. Mm. Uh, and then <laughs> uh, Torah was the way given to Moses, peace be upon him, and Quran was the way given to Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. But there were many other revelations by name. I don't know. Similarly, by name, only 25 messengers are mentioned in the Quran: Adam, Noah, Abraham, Moses, Jesus, Muhammad, peace be upon them all. But the Prophet said 124,000 messengers were sent on the face of the earth. You ask me the question. Anybody Can from India? Yes. yes. Okay. So you ask me the question, can Krishna be considered as word of, can Krishna be a messenger of Allah? Can Ram be a messenger of Allah? I said maybe. Maybe yes, maybe no. I don't know. I cannot say Ram alayhi salam because his name is not mentioned. Maybe he is, maybe he is not. Can you consider Veda to be the word of God? Was the earlier question. I can say maybe, maybe not. I don't know. But if I read the Bible today, there are certain things mentioned in the Bible I cannot agree. Bible says that Lut alayhi salam, knows Billah, he had incest with his daughter. I cannot believe. So what I say, Bible is the changed form of the Injil. It is not original form. So today also what you have, if you put to test all the religious except the Quran, the test of science, they will fail. I'm not here to give a lecture on 
disagreement between the Veda and the science I can give. But that's not my purpose. So if you put this test of science to Bible, to Veda, to all other scriptures, they will fail except Quran. So even if it was the word of God, today what you have is the changed form. So what I can say, Veda may be the word of God, I don't know. Krishna may be the prophet, maybe, maybe, I don't know. But, but the point to be noted, all the prophets that came before last and final messenger prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, they were only meant for those people at that time. Like Moses, peace be upon him, was only sent for the Jews. Isa a.s. was only sent for the Jews. But Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the last and final messenger. He was not sent only for the Muslims or the Arabs. He was sent for the whole of humanity. So even if I agree that Ram was a prophet of God, even if Krishna was a prophet of God, he was meant for those people at that time. Today, all the human beings, whether they're living in Malaysia or Saudi Arabia or India or Pakistan or USA or UK, you have to follow the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. That was what is mentioned in Kalki Avatar. Yes. That is what is mentioned in the Bible in the Gospel of John, chapter number 16, verse number 12 to 14. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, I have many things to say unto you, but he cannot bear them now. For he, when the spirit of truth shall come, he shall guide you unto all truth. He shall not speak of himself, all that here shall he speak. He shall glorify me. So Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, I have many things to say, but you can understand now. When Prophet Muhammad will come, he will tell you, peace be upon him. Same thing in Kalki Avatar. So I'm telling, even if Ram was a messenger of God, I'm not saying he was, even if he was, even if Krishna was, all of them pointed out to a final messenger to come, Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. Even if Veda was the word of God, all the messages, all the revelations that came before the Quran were only meant for those people at that time. But Quran is not meant only for the Muslims or the Arab. The Quran says in Surah Ibrahim chapter 14 verse number 1, in Surah Ibrahim chapter 14 verse 52, it's mentioned several places that the Quran is sent for the whole of humanity. So even if Veda was the word of God, even if Bible was the word of God, today you have to follow the last and final revelation of the glorious Quran. So I'm not conflicting, I'm conciliating. So your scriptures talk about the last messenger to come, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, with the last revelation of the Quran. And if you, sister, believe that there's one God, and you believe idol worship is wrong, and you believe that Prophet Muhammad is a messenger, according to me, you are a Muslim. Would you like to say it? Yes. Would you like to say it in Arabic? Same thing. That there's one God? <laughs> one God, yeah. And Prophet Muhammad is a messenger. Would you like to say it in Arabic? Would you like to say it in Arabic? I will say it and you can repeat it. Yeah, but... Is, <laughs> is anyone forcing you to do it? No, 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 no force. Are you doing it of your own free will? Yes. Otherwise, Vaya Murthy will say that Zakir is, you know, <laughs> you know, someone told me that the Hindra went to UK and they said that Malaysia is doing ethnic cleansing. <laughs> so you are saying out of your own free will. Yes. So tomorrow, Vaya Murthy comes, you can testify that Dr. Zakina I didn't force you. I'll just say it in Arabic and you can repeat it. Okay? Ashadu. Allah, Allah, Ilaha, Ilaha, Illallah, Illallah, Wa Ashadu, Wa Ashadu, Anna, Anna, Muhammadan, Muhammadan, Abduhu, Abduhu, Wa Rasuluhu, Wa Rasuluhu. I bear witness, I bear witness, that, that, there is no God, there is no God, but Allah, but Allah, and I bear witness, and I bear a witness, that, that, Prophet Muhammad, Prophet Muhammad, is the messenger, is the messenger, and servant of God, and servant of God. MashaAllah, you are a Muslim sister, and I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may he give you more guidance. We have come here to unite. We have not come here to divide. And my same policy with the Muslims. There are different Muslims. In Islam, there should be no sect. Unfortunately, because of culture, the culture of India is different, Pakistan is different, Malaysia is different, Indonesia is different. But we all are the creator of the same God, and we should follow the same faith. There can be difference in culture, no problem. But our deen, in the deen, in the light of Islam. I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may he guide you more. And through you, let more human beings unite. And I pray to Allah that may he grant you Jannah, so that you get paradise, inshallah. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, brother, name and your profession. Assalamu alaikum, Ustad. Wa alaikum assalam. Uh, my name is Bilal Girinet. Uh, I'm from Australia and a student of Islamic finance and banking. I just want to first say that my friends and I are your biggest fans. Uh, the question is, 
science is on the move to send rockets and build a civilization on Mars. What is the Qibla on Mars? Uh, what does the Islam and the Quran say about that? And will science be successful? <coughs> well, that was a question that science is advancing and they are sending rockets to Mars. And what is the Qibla in Mars? When we reach them, then inshallah we'll get the right answer. At present, we're here. Anyway, the ruling is that if you're flying in a plane, and if you're, if, you're, if you're traveling in a vehicle, when you start your salah, it should face the Qibla. And if the vehicle changes, yet it is accepted. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse number 177, it is not righteousness that you turn your face to the east and west. It is righteousness that you believe in Allah. You believe in the book, you believe in the angels. Qibla is our direction. It is for unity. So today if you have to pray here, some will say let's pray south, some will say west, some will say east. So Qibla, sorry, is for unity. It's for unity. So that we face in one direction. And we all pray together, that's important. So if you're traveling in a vehicle, when the vehicle starts, you face in that direction when it starts. And then if it changes, it's accepted because the niya is more important. That is the meaning. And if you cannot identify, if you don't have a compass, and you can identify, that doesn't mean you don't pray. <coughs> to your best of sense, what you can identify, if you don't have any compass and you don't know where it is, then that doesn't mean you don't pray. You, all of, if there are few people, the best that you can feel, that you can, from your sense, you think that is, and you pray that way. Hope that was the question. Jazakallah. Assalamu alaikum. I'm Fuzia Latif from Pakistan. I'm an environmental student. I have some questions, sir. Um, what do you think that, uh, uh, is this the man who is uh, destroying environment and uh, this scientific uh, growth is leading to the end of the world? So please, I want uh, the question in the, um, from Quran and Hadith. Thank you. Sister, I have the question that the man is destroying environment and is it leading to the end of the world? <coughs> I do agree that science and technology, it has pros and cons, advantage and disadvantage. Sometimes the advantage is more than disadvantage, sometimes the disadvantage is more than advantage. You know, previously there was no telephone. Then telephone came, then mobile came. Our peace of mind is disrupted. Now you cannot think of living without a mobile, correct? Previously, now mobile you're carrying everywhere, you're going to the bathroom also carrying your mobile, you're sleeping with your mobile, you're, you're with your family and the mobile disturbs. So it's good. Is mobile good? Yes, good. Bad? Yes, it's bad. Advantage, disadvantage. Previously, you used to sleep peacefully. Now you can do things with the press of a button. You can speak, you can see your family from across the world. But it's disrupting your peace also. Mobile by the radiation going to your brain, they can be cancer. There are so many research. Good, bad. Technology, good, bad. We as Muslims, we as Muslims, we have to see to it that we stick to Quran and Surah, irrespective how much science and technology advances. We as Muslims should follow the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Mul, chapter number 6 and verse number 2, Allah khalaq al mawta wal hayata. It's Allah who has created death and life to test which of you is good in deeds. Irrespective how much the science advances, you have to follow Quran and Sunnah. You cannot say because science is advancing, I will not follow Quran and Sunnah. If the science is advancing, and with the help of the sign, you can follow better Quran, so no, no problem. But that doesn't mean. So we as Muslim, this is a test for us. I agree with you that many a time science and technology advancing is spoiling the environment. It is benefiting. There are factories coming which is helping us. It is helping us in many things, how to lead life. It is even spoiling the environment. There are pros and cons. <coughs> we as Muslims should see to it that when we do anything, it should not go against Quran and Sunnah, that is important. Yeah. Our basic thing is, let the advancement be as much as we want. We have to follow the basics. 
ያፍቶ አፈ ሰላም ያፍቶ አፈ ሰላም እደር ወደወር ይዋ ወደየን ማዛ ወደየ ወደር ሳይንስ እና ቴክኒክስ አድቫንሲንግ ናው ኢን ዘ ሞባይል አይ ከን ኖ ማይ ኪብላ ቬሪ ኢዚሊ አይ ጀስት ፕሬስ ዘ ቡተን አይ ጌት ዲ አንሰር ሶ ዊ አስ ሙስሊም ሹድ ሪአላይዝ ዘት ዊ ሹድ ሲ ቱ ዘት ዊ ዱ ኖት ብሬክ ኤኒ ሩልስ ኤንድ ሬጉሌሽን አይ ዱ አግሪ ዊዝ ዩ ዘት ሳይንስ እና ቴክኖሎጂ ኢዝ ስፖይሊንግ ኤንቫይሮንመንት ቡት ኢት ኢዝ ቤኒፊቲንግ አስ አልሶ ሜኒ ታይምስ ዘ ቤኒፊትስ አ ሞ ዘን ዘ ኤድቫንቴጅስ ያ if this uh, scientific growth is leading to kiamat is there any uh, mention uh, this is, is this mentioned Especially in quran saying that is the scientific growth leading to kiamat the kiamat La- will come like end of uh, word you know it is akhir zaman yeah akhir zaman so is the quran this is a question is this scientific growth leading to kiamat if it leading then don't involve in science it's nothing like that no 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 it's not like that <laughs> i'm just joking <laughs> anyway the quran clearly says in surah luqman chapter number 31 verse number 27 <coughs> no one knows the hour when will the kiyama come no one knows yeah. whether the science advances or not kiyama will come now there are certain signs given in the quran for the kiyama given in the hadith mm-hmm. many signs so will is it leading is it close yes it's coming closer how close i don't know one of the f- early signs of kiyama is the last and final messenger prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam every sign of kiyama is not good every sign of kiyama is not bad one of the signs of kiyama is muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam only after the last messenger will come can the kiyama come but that's a good sign so prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is the last messenger before the last messenger kiyama cannot come there are other signs of kiyama that the prophet said that the bedouin arabs will compete with each other in making tall buildings and now you saw the tallest buildings in the muslim areas mm-hmm. it's good bad you don't know <coughs> people will compete in making mosques there are many so all the signs which are mentioned are indicating that kiyama is coming closer but there is nothing mentioned that the difference between the first sign and the second sign whether it is one day whether it's one year whether it's 10 year whether it's 100 year, allah alam so if the signs are coming we can say kiyama is coming close you cannot say for sure whether i will see that kiyama or not no one can say only allah knows no one knows yeah. so these signs are coming that means yes kiyama is approaching but when whether it will take another one day allah alam can come tomorrow can come after 10 days can come after 10 years after 100 years after million years maybe after billion years i don't know only allah knows so we should not be so much bothered whether the kiyama comes or not sister you have to offer five times a day okay Correct? thank you <laughs> our, our beloved prophet said even tomorrow if you know kiyama they yet plant a tree no problem you cannot say that tomorrow if kiyama you will get reward for your good deeds so you should think no problem but that doesn't mean it should trouble you your lifestyle will not change you should lead your life that today maybe your last day with the kiyama is there million years afterwards or 10 days afterwards you should lead your life that you follow all the farais do as much as mustab as you can Ab- 100% don't do any haram abstain from the makru with the kiyama comes or not so we as muslim should follow quran and sunnah so that we pass this test of examination and in the akhirah we go to jannah inshallah mm-hmm. and pray to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may he accept our efforts and put all of us in jannah inshallah Amen. thank you sir that's most welcome if there any non muslim like to ask a question any non muslim in the audience or anyone who sitting would like to ask a question you can jump the queue in my session the non muslims are are the guest of honors any non muslims would like to ask a question you can ask any questions you can criticize islam you can attack me no problem i'm young i can take it though i've got white beard any non muslim have any questions Okay, sir. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, I am Muhammad Sulaiman, PhD student from Bangladesh. Uh, thank you for your beginning speech that Quran is not a science, uh, it's also a, a, a sign. Uh, I think this is also new thinking for us. Uh, but my question, I have two questions if you allow, that uh, first of all, uh, we always try to prove that Quran is scientific or the perfectness of Quran with the new innovation, uh, uh, invention or existence our theory that quran is this and this is the perfect uh, but why not uh, we uh, first start that there are some contradict with the existence things 
and this is the Quran, uh, the word of Allah, then Quran is true. Why not? Uh, and in your sense, now what are the burning issues that these are the contradict of science or others with Quran that we can, uh, that are the inspiration for our research. Second issue is, uh, in the word of Allah, that uh, the business is halal. One eat. question, one uh, question at time, because there are many people and we have shortage of time. Uh, I would love to speak fast, but uh, we have the Jummah Qutbah. Well, the question that, why do we try and prove Quran is scientific? Why don't we take out the contradiction and say, this is Quran, this is correct? Brother, the point to be noted, there is no contradiction in Quran and science. Let me tell you very clearly. There is, non -verse, there is not a single verse in the Quran which is contradicting established science. It may contradict theories and hypotheses. For example, we say that Quran is again Darwin's theory. There are many things which Quran says which science hasn't confirmed. Many things. For example, Quran speaks about how will our world end, which many scientific hypotheses match with it, some don't. But I'm saying this is what the Quran says, I believe in it. So I start believing in the hypothesis that matches with the Quran. Quran says there is life beside this earth. Quran says in Surah Furqan, chapter 25, verse number 59, Allah has created the heaven and the earth and everything in between it. He has put living creatures. I believe. Now science is sending rockets to Mars and to other parts. Science may come to know 50 years later, 100 years later. I believe today there is life beside this earth. Quran talks about heaven and hell, which science hasn't discovered. Quran talks about jinn, which very little scientists believe. Most of them don't. So there are many things yet today what Quran says which science hasn't proven yet. But science even cannot disprove it. So that goes in the ambiguous slot. Ambiguous means unknown. But me as a Muslim, I believe in it. Can we do research? Yes, people are doing research. There are organizations set up for that. There is an organization in Makkah called the Scientific Science of Quran and Sunnah, which is doing research. So there are people doing. And maybe after science will advance, more and more of the things which are ambiguous will come out to be true. But the point to be noted, there is not a single verse of the Quran which is against established science. There are many things which the Quran says which science hasn't yet confirmed. Neither can it prove it wrong, so we as Muslims believe in it. That is the reason we are striving for the Akhirah. Science doesn't believe in Akhirah. Science doesn't believe in life after death. We believe in it. That is the reason we follow Quran and Sunnah. And I've given the talk on does God exist? Where I've proved scientifically the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Thank you. That's it. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Shumaila Umar from Pakistan. I am working on uh, women rights, so my question is regarding slavery. Slavery is against human rights. So what's the concept of slavery in Islam, especially female slaves and keeping relation with them with nikah or without nikah? This is quite some verses I read. It's quite confusing for me. Sister has a question that she is doing research on women, right? And, and she's saying that as far as slavery is concerned, what is the view of Islam? And can, can Muslim have slave, etc., etc. As far as you read the Quran, there are several verses of the Quran which talk about freeing of slaves. Talks about freeing of slaves. As you realize, Quran is a book which is to be followed till the last day. If you analyze the rules and regulation of the Quran, the Quran was revealed at a time where slavery was very common. Quran is the only religious book on the face of the earth which gives the rules and regulation of how to treat a slave. You can't overburden a slave. There are rules and regulation kept. Today, if you see the UN Charter, you know, and if you want to put it right, like in slavery in Islam can only take place if there is a war. And if in the war, they can be slaves. Today, internationally, slavery is abolished. But today, we have POW. You know POW? Prisoner of war. Prisoner of war. Now, if you analyze the UN Charter, which is supposed to be the most humane, if you know what's happening in Guantanamo Bay, it's totally against Islam. Yet they're doing it, the Americans. They claim to be the most humane people in the world, the maximum human rights, according to me. 
the most unjust people in the world. And maximum violation of human rights in any country, it is done by the American government. The American may be good. I'm talking about the American government. And that is the reason I'm, I'm there on the list also. You know? <laughs> because I prove it to the world. Now today, if you analyze in a prisoner of war sister, in a prisoner of war, any prisoner of war, any country, they are enclosed in a jail, correct? In Islam, a slave is not enclosed. You know that? So in Islam, I believe that tomorrow is slavery. Islam encourages freeing of slave. Say, if you cannot marry, give the freedom to the slave as mahar, Quranic verse, also in Nur. That give the freedom as a mahar. So in Islam, there are various options given. Today, of course, Islam discourages slavery. But if slavery has to come back, the only religious book, the only constitution which gives rise to the slave is Islam. If you follow the constitution, even of the UN Charter, if you read, it is nowhere close to Islam. So when you are talking, in Islam what is slave? It is prisoner of war. No, about laundies, like there's yes, concept yes. of laundies. Yes, yes, that's, that's again, it's prisoner of war. What your right hand possesses is the word in the Quran. What your right hand possesses. What your right hand possesses. So there are rules and regulations laid down in Islam. And always Islam has encouraged freeing of slave. Always. But if you have to maintain a slave, there are some rules and regulations. Unlike in other, what the others do, they do without telling. In, in normal prisoners of war camp, what happens? There's homosexuality, gays, lesbians, adultery, common. It is not in the rule book, but it is common. In Islam, Allah says in Surah Nisa chapter 4, verse number 3, marry women of a choice in two, threes, or fours. If you can't do justice, marry only one. According to American statistics, an average American before he marries, he has eight sexual partners. How many? Eight. Average. Some may have one, some may have two, some may have hundred. Eight. After he marries, how many has is not mentioned in the statistics? Eight. In Islam, having sex besides your wife, it is prohibited. Yes, when there is slavery, that was permitted. Today, it's abolished. When there is. What you have to realize, it doesn't go down the throat. It, Islam doesn't say marrying more than one wife is compulsory. According to me, it is mobile. But if you marry, you have to be just between your wife. And today in the world, there are more women than male. In USA alone, there are 4.8 million females more than male. If every man marries a woman, yet there'll be 4.8 million females more than male. So what will happen? For these 4.8 million females, they either marry a man who already has a wife or become public property. Oh, public property is such a harsh word. It is the most sophisticated word I can use, sister. So Islam has the solution to the problems of humankind and the problems of womankind. Islam only has the solution. There, what they do? They are selling their daughters. They are selling their mothers. They are talking about women's liberalization. Whenever you see an ad, invariably you see a woman. Now I'm asking you a question. More men drive cars or women drive cars? Men drive cars. But in the ad of a car, you'll invariably find a woman. You know, I was told in a very famous ad of BMW, in, in front of the car, there's a lady with a bikini saying, test drive her now. Who, the girl or the car? <laughs> so they're selling their daughter, they're talking about women liberalization. They're actually selling their daughter, selling their mother, selling their sisters. In Islam, we respect our mother. We respect our daughter, respect our sister. This is the hijab. They put the blame. Oh, they are subjugating the woman by keeping her in hijab. We are not subjugating, we are uplifting. If this is subjugation coming in a bikini ad in front of a car, we are happy to be subjugated by the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes. So what you have to realize, sister, it is more words, women liberalization. It is nothing but a disguised form of exploitation for body, dignity for soul, and deprivation of honor. In the garb of women liberalization, in the name of art and culture, they are selling their daughters. So they talk about women. That's the reason today, amongst those people, the fastest growing religion in Europe is Islam. In America is Islam. In world Islam. And out of those people accepting Islam, two-thirds are women, sister. Why? 
So if Islam is subjugating the women, why are the American women accepting Islam? Why are the European women, why are the European women accepting Islam? Because they find that Islam is the only religion which uplifts them and gives them respect, sister. And for more details, you can refer to my talk on, on, on the topic women that is Islam. You should get more answers. Thank you. Okay, all right. So thank you very much, Dr. Zakir. I'm so sorry I have to cut this session like you, uh, due to time constraints. So, uh, Ampun Tuan Ku, with all respect, I would like to invite uh, Duli Yang Mahamulia Tuan Po Jabrilis to present a token of appreciation to our own guest, Dr. Zakir Naik, please. <laughs>